Andrew, you really have two ways of thinking about the world, science and religion, in a very deep, profound way about both. And you made a, a very uh, interesting comment that I read, uh, that if uh, you have a, a hard problem in science, you shouldn't look to God or theology, which is the so-called God of the gaps, but do better science. And on the other hand, which is the interesting one, is that if you have a problem in, uh, in uh, 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 theology, you shouldn't look to science because there is no answer in God, but you should try to do better theology. Mm. Uh, what, what gives you the, the thought pattern to come to those kinds of parallel conclusions? I'm so glad that it's possible to embrace both science and theology because those two academic disciplines each ask really important questions that are really interesting and that really matter. Uh, the questions that they ask are different and their methodologies are different. But beyond that, they have an enormous amount in common. Both science and theology care passionately about the truth. Uh, they're both concerned to uh, look at the evidence and to evaluate it with rigorous thinking. And both of them lend themselves to uh, practical applications. So, you know, just as the transition from science to engineering or from science to medicine is a seamless transition. Uh, so um, the transition from theology to the way that people live their lives should also be a seamless transition. And of course both can be abused, science can be abused, um, religion can be abused, you, both of them can do harm and damage, but at their best um, you know, science has changed our lives for the better out of all recognition. And the good that's come out of belief in God and religious practice has also been absolutely enormous. Many people would challenge the symmetry by which you're describing this um, on many levels. Uh, the first being that we know for sure that we're making progress in science and um, it is certainly less universally obvious that we've ever made any progress in theology. Um, that seems to be a, a big fundamental difference. When you talk about the, the fundamental difference between the progress that is made in science and the progress is, that's made in theology, but actually the, the parallels are closer than a lot of people would recognize. Just take the 19th century, for example. So in the 19th century, we had uh, huge progress in the understanding of the origin of species in the field of biology. And uh, no less significant was the progress, though it's less well known, or less celebrated, was the progress that was made in the understanding of electromagnetic fields, which influences every bit of communication that we enjoy more or less the same time that these advances were being made in uh, science, huge advances were being made in our knowledge of uh, ancient Near Eastern texts, with the discovery of some very important um, Babylonian texts in areas that we would now call Iraq and Iran. And uh, those have enormously illuminated our understanding of particularly the Hebrew Bible. So I think that we can now understand uh, a lot of the Old Testament uh, more accurately in a, and in a better informed way than was previously possible. And it would seem to be that that, that progress is, is a demythicalization. So it, it, uh, what people may have thought was just pure revelation now we find is occurring in different societies at that time. So uh, the progress which I, I, I agree, it is progress in understanding it, but it seems to be um, undermining the theological revelation and more showing its sociological context. It, it's a mistake <coughs> to think that because you've discovered more about the way that other people were writing at the time, therefore that explains away what we find in the, um, the Hebrew and the Greek Bible. 
So uh, it's true that we find that they were talking about concepts of creation, uh, just as we find more about the vocabulary, because after all, the, the, the scriptures were written in vocabulary that was available at the time. So let's take an example of um, the descriptions that we discover of creation in mm -hmm. a text like the Enuma Elish. Mm -hmm. And there you have um, three generations of gods, and the grandchildren are a bit wild. They have a rather drunken party, yeah. and their stereo is turned up very loud and <laughs> keeps the grandparents awake, and the grandparents don't like it. Yeah. And Tiamat, the grandmother, tells them to shut up, be quiet. And the, uh, the teenage grandchildren gods don't like this. And so they, uh, they, they, they more or less say, who's going to go and bump off <laughs> Granny? <laughs> and uh, the guy who draws the short straw is Marduk. And uh, Marduk uh, goes to, uh, to kill his grandmother. And uh, he causes an... Oh, well, she opens her mouth to devour him, the text says, and he causes an evil wind to blow into it, so she can't shut her mouth. And then he fires an arrow into her mouth and kills her, and she falls over dead with this distended belly. And Marduk takes out his sword and cuts her in half. And with half, he creates the sky. <laughs> now, I don't know whether the writer of Genesis 1 had actually got a copy of the Numa Elish in front of him, probably not. But let's suppose he lived in, a, in an environment, in a culture, where that sort of story was common currency. The sort of Grimm's fairy tales of the time. And he picks up his stylus and he says, it wasn't like that at all. How can I describe what it was really like? Brashith bara Elohim eth hashamayim wa eth haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, just the simple clarity of that, and one could go on in great detail. I think, as a majesty, and it's saying something utterly different from what the contemporary writings of the time were saying elsewhere.